Star Wars Knights of the Old Republic, the book. Based on Star Wars Knights of the Old Republic, the video game. Based on Star Wars, the movie. Hello, everybody, and welcome to a special edition of our podcast here at Maho Studio. We're going to be reviewing an RPG today, but not just an RPG, but the book behind the RPG. Uh, with me today is my good co-host, Adam. Hello, hello. And a writer for Polygon, StarWars.com, Rolling Stone, a video game magnate, as it were. It's uh, the author of the upcoming boss fight book, Star Wars Knights of the Old Republic, Alex Kane. Hey, thanks so much. Oh, my gosh. Ooh. Yeah, so we'll get some of the formalities out of the way. Uh, so, Alex, uh, how long have you been writing about video games? Uh, about three years. So, yeah, Kill Screen put out, like, one of the editors back when Kill Screen published stuff, they had editors and staff writers, and they, they put out a tweet that said, you know, we need some freelance news people. And I sort of emailed the editor, the news editor there, and I said, I'm in my car. I don't have any clips that I can link right this second, but I've been, you know, published for, what, five, six years now professionally. I've got some clips that are sort of gaming related very loosely, and I would love to give it a shot, you know? And yeah, I mean, he, he really took a chance on me because I sort of had, I had like nonfiction stuff, but I didn't have what you'd call games journalism clips. You know, I had, I had stuff that I'd written essays about whatever. And then, yeah. So I, I wound up making a really good first impression. The first couple pieces I did for him, you really liked. And yeah, I got really lucky a couple times after that. And you know, when kill screen closed down, I got lucky and, and fell into writing for Rolling Stones, Glixel. They fired all their staff, <laughs> you know, uh, same thing, uh, closed that down. I had sort of got lucky and, and have continued to write for some really great places. So, um, I've been very fortunate to have some good relationships with great editors. So, um, yeah, I don't know how I've been doing it for three years. It doesn't seem possible. <laughs> <laughs> I've been to a couple voice acting panels in Sakura Khan. A lot of the same thing. Just pure blind luck. Just do the thing guys. <laughs> yeah. Nobody wants to admit it, but like so much of any measure of success is just getting lucky one day and suddenly, suddenly you're doing the thing that you've been trying to do for 10 years. Like it just happens. Pretty amazing. Yeah. It sounds like that kind of got you into talking with uh, boss fight books, potentially about writing a book for them. Originally, uh, from what I was looking up, you pitched Halo 2 first and then ended up on KOTOR. How did that happen? Yeah. So Basically, Boss Fight does an open submissions period where they read pitches from anyone for about a month. Um, basically, every year they do this in like the month of May or so. And May 2015, I was like, hey, I've got publishing experience. I've got editing experience. I've published all this stuff, you know, sh short form stuff. I haven't written a book, but I would love to write a book about Halo 2 because I was a big Halo nerd. Uh, still am, you know, but... <laughs> um, yeah, and they were like, well, this is an excellent pitch, and uh, no thanks, <laughs> you know, and, <laughs> and, uh, and, but they were like, you know, but keep in touch, we can tell you're passionate, like, keep in touch, and so I did, so I was very annoying, and, and would email him probably, you know, every six months, I would kind of, like, touch base and be like, hey, I'm still fiddling around with potentially, you know, putting together that Halo 2 book. I wrote some more sample chapters, so it was like, it was sort of optional that you could pitch a book and include a sample chapter. So that's what I did. And then I just kept writing chapters and they were not, <laughs> they're not anything that I would want somebody to see, but I think they did prove that I had like some spark of like, okay, I can probably write a whole book about this game if I push on through. But of course I wasn't making any money doing that. So then I, you know, I was doing the kill screen stuff. I did the Glixel stuff and, and wrote for kill screens to, uh, they had two other blogs, one on virtual reality and one on esports. And that kept me busy for about a year. And then they had another submissions period. And I was like, man, um, I'm kind of uh, over the Halo thing at the moment. You know, I'm really into Star Wars mode with all the movies coming out and things like that. You know, by that point, Halo 2 or yeah, Halo 2's 10 year anniversary had been like basically two years ago by that point. So I kind of missed the boat on that in terms of the anniversary Whereas, you know, we're living in sort of a, a second golden age of Star Wars stuff right now. So I kind of was like, here's my idea for a KOTOR book. And then, yeah, called me up and said, well, which one do you want to write? I said, let's do Knights of the Republic. And then I did not write a book even remotely like the one that they accepted and that I signed a contract <laughs> for. So that's kind of the funny thing about it is um, 
you know, sort of fell into writing for StarWars.com because I had the Rolling Stone clips and, and just got lucky there and sort of learned how I enjoy telling nonfiction stories. I read a lot of books that were very sort of like, oh, man, this book is so damn good. I want to write something like this. You know, that happened a lot in the course of the <laughs> year and a half, two years that I was working on this thing. So it evolved over the course of that process of, you know, writing horrible draft after horrible draft and kind of like seeing it take shape kind of organically and just slowly turn into something that's not even remotely what I told them I was going to write. And thankfully they were supportive of that. They were okay with it. So that's good. Yeah. What got me interested, because again, I'm not the Star Wars expert here. That's why I have Adam. Only one of us had a lightsabers commissioned for the wedding and it wasn't me. Yeah. Um, totally me. Had two of them. One for me and one for my wife. Wonderful. But uh, what got me interested is I really, I get super excited about books about how the sausage gets made. Like, I really like the book Console Wars. And yeah, and the way that, uh, the way I saw the, the KOTOR book was, a, was exactly the same. Like, oh my gosh, we get to hear about it from the people behind the scenes and like all the, the nonsense and drama that happens trying to put one of these damn things together. I get really excited hearing about that stuff because it, it pulls back a little bit of the, the curtain and it is magic, even knowing what happened, it still feels like magic that it even worked in the first place. It's a common story with video games, right? It's like, uh, what's the metaphor he uses? Like they were, they were building the plane while it was, while it, <laughs> while it was like falling to the ground, you know, or whatever, while they were in free fall, they were assembling the plane in midair, <laughs> yeah. um, is what I think Gallagher says in the book. And, and, uh, yeah, I mean, those stories are always kind of fun, um, inherently, you know, yeah, I think video games uh, are really a unique medium in that, you know, every every little piece, every little line of code can just shatter the, everything else. You know, it can all fall apart. <laughs> so, you know, it definitely seems like uh, kind of like what you were saying about writing some of these first drafts for, for boss fight books. That's kind of how, how gaming is, too, from the way I see it, is that uh, they'll start with a concept for a game and as they're working on it, like, oh, things will change, they'll decide what works and what doesn't work, so... Yep. I feel like there's a similarity there. Yeah, I mean, in the book, you know, I talk about KOTOR was like that, you know, it morphed into something completely different than what LucasArts wanted Bioware to do. Anthem began pre-production and, and IP development in 2012, and then it came out, what, in February of 2019? <laughs> it's nothing like what it was originally supposed to be, really. <laughs> so, I mean, yeah, you know, it's funny, like, these things, they do, they just evolve and evolve, and Bethesda, you know, announced Starfield, what, a year ago? That game had been rumored to be in development for, like, years and years now, and, and it's just like, you know, these things... That they take a long time to kind of gestate and and uh, oh, yeah. for technology to kind of fall into sync with the vision to like Anthem, the big thing that made it click. Uh, if if it did indeed click, is the fly <laughs> the flying right the flying and the mobility. So yeah, and that was sort of like the last thing that uh, they did, sort of mechanically and sort of in terms of the the bones of it. I think. Yeah, because it, it kind of worked, but it didn't, so they kept taking it out because they couldn't get it yeah. to work. And then, but but flying makes it awesome, so we have to make it work, guys. And it just kept coming in and out and in and out. And then uh, I was reading Kotaku's expose on that, and they had the uh, the Christmas Eve demo, and there was no flying, and it wasn't very popular. So they built one just for one of the high-level executives who played it and didn't like it, and he was blown away after they put the flying back in. There were other tweaks that were done, but just... There's certain things you have to do to to make the magic work for some of these games. Yeah. S speaking of making the magic work, you know, from a mechanic standpoint, KOTOR is very much, you know, a Dungeons and Dragons style game. You know, some, mm -hmm. you know, like games that Byward made previously, like Neverwinter Nights and Baldur's Gate and things like that. But I think the, the magic there, and I think it's a magic that defined Byward for years and years to come, would be the, not just the story, but specifically the characters, yeah, the dialogue wheel and things like that. Yes, definitely. One of the big things about the uh, the game that people still talk about 16 years after its release, spoiler alert if you haven't played this 16-year-old game, uh, the big twist, which still blows my mind as I think about it in 2019, what were some of your reactions getting to that point in, in KOTOR the first time, you know, all those years ago? 
Yeah, I was like, I got this game for my birthday when I turned like 14, I believe it was. So, I mean, you know, I was I was sort of in that phase where that kind of stuff could really impress me and really um, catch me off guard. I, I think I saw Fight Club around that same time. I, you know, that was, what, four years after that movie came out. And Fight Club came out in 99. The Sixth Sense came out in 99. That was sort of... The Matrix came out in 99. So it was sort of that era where in movies, the whole plot hinged on like the red pill, blue pill kind of deal where it's like you can't really trust anything. The narrative is uh, really slippery and at any moment it all might come, you know, unraveling, so to speak. And and that's sort of the fun of movies like Fight Club and Sixth Sense when you're like, oh, man, how did I not see this coming? Of course, if you, <laughs> you know, if you played KOTOR as like, you know, slightly older or whatever, um, maybe you you saw clues and figured it out. Like, I'll watch movies nowadays that have like a sort of KOTOR twist. And I see it coming from, you know, light years away because I grew up watching those kinds of things. Um I guess another spoiler alert, but I mean, Captain Marvel is like that. Captain Marvel is basically like the the plot of KOTOR. <laughs> like, <laughs> you know? um, uh, I watched Captain Marvel and I'm just like, oh, it's, it's KOTOR, you know, except with Brie Larson. So it's like slightly, slightly, you know, better in that regard. Uh, <laughs> you, you know, she's prettier than Revan maybe, but um, <laughs> no, but yeah, but that movie is a lot of fun. And of course, like most of the people who went to the theater and saw Captain Marvel probably didn't play KOTOR 16 years ago. So it's fine. You can tell those kinds of stories again and they become new again for new audiences. But yeah, I think Bioware really achieved something special. I mean, you know, games like Morrowind that came out like a year before, they did a lot of crazy, cool story stuff. But they didn't have that kind of production value where you have full voiceover with all the characters and this very sort of cinematic eye for things where, you know, even the the moment to moment conversations you're having with these characters are sort of framed cinematically. You know, there's cut scenes are used sparingly, but it's like they you don't notice that because the game itself looked so Star Warsy, you know, for yeah, lack yeah. of a, a better term like it. uh it it really sells itself as sort of like, oh man, you know, I'm I'm in Star Wars. This is fun, and yeah, yeah. The the art direction was really good. Uh, I wanted to work our, our way back a little bit because when you talk about like the reveal of Darth Revan and playing it back mm -hmm. in 2003, I think it'd be fun to to talk about for a second because we're all a little bit long in the tooth. We're children of the 80s. You know, these stories are coming back around and being seen by fresh audiences. How did it feel? when you got the game. There's no Facebook, there's no Twitter, there's no YouTube, there's no wiki. Like, if you heard about Darth Revan, you heard about it from some kid at high school and you called him an idiot because there's no way that could be true. <laughs> right, exactly. So so it's like, I got this probably the day it came out or like four days after it came out, something like that, you know. Um, my birthday was like six days after this game came out. So I, I believe I got it four days before my birthday or whatever like you know what I mean so my point being that <laughs> that I was like the first in my group of friends or in my class even probably to play it and, and really like if I was on the internet it wasn't so much to like read Star Wars spoilers I would be like fooling around with like RPG maker and like dumb stuff like that or or like building a website in GeoCities and all those stupid things that we used to play <laughs> with back 16 years ago when we were you know on the internet yeah. kind of not having Twitter and not having Instagram but still like having those very human impulses to like try to you know put our graffiti on the internet right like kind of <laughs> I just Salt. listened to the hamster dance about a million times like everybody <laughs> else did. <laughs> I'm going to have to Google that now because that doesn't ring a bell, but I'm oh, sure man. I'm sure when I Google it. I am so sorry. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> but, yeah, I mean, like, it, it absolutely blew my mind. I mean, yeah, I did not see the, the twist coming. You know, that, that may have been, I think, you know, I saw Sixth Sense probably a few years before KOTOR. But I hadn't seen, like, The Born Identity yet, I don't think. I hadn't seen Fight Club until, like, a year or two later. Yeah, so, I mean, it, it really did catch me off guard. It changes everything about the story. It changes, like, all the kind of uh, background lore in the game a little bit, too. You kind of have to, like, reorient yourself with, like, some of the conversations you've had. And, but, I mean, the bottom line is it, it suddenly this character is you – 
suddenly you matter in the Star Wars galaxy, right? You you keep hearing about this all important figure, the shadowy figure who disappeared and Darth Revan. Yes, yeah. yes, Revan. <laughs> you know, sort of the the guy who's even scarier than the villain. You know, he's you know even. He was Malik's master, and oh boy, he was bad news. And you know, oh it's, shit, it's me. So okay, <laughs> yeah, I don't know. It's it's uh, it's like sort of the hook that gets a lot of people to try the game nowadays. I think, but you do have to really work to get there. You know, there's kind of there's a lot of story that happens before that point. But I think that it's sort of the big payoff. You know, I think that uh, I played through the game a bunch of times while I was working on the book. Like I don't know how many times, like four four times or something. Like while I was writing. You get to that point and that's sort of like the big satisfying moment. And then it's like, well, I can't leave Bastila with Malik to be tortured. So I better go like help her out. And then also like, yeah, like all the, the ending stuff is fun, but yeah, that, that climactic reveal is like, it's just so dramatic and, and Darth Malik sort of, uh, striding down that red hallway is just like, He's like, ah, um, oh, shit, here he comes. <laughs> it's, yeah, it's it's good stuff. I mean, you know, if somebody likes Star Wars and, and they haven't played the game, um, well, sorry about spoiling it, but, I mean, that, that stuff is like, you know, where it really feels like Star Wars. That's where it kind of, um, you know, you get that Darth Vader moment. Yeah, and, and I love the cutscene, too, with the Revan reveal because it it does flashbacks to all these lines of dialogue you've probably heard you know, mm-hmm. talking about wiping memories and how the Jedi don't kill anybody. And then silence. And you see a black hooded figure and it's you. And after it shows you, the cutscene is still silent. There's just the dramatic music swelling and then Malik states it so matter-of-factly. I'm surprised to see you here, Revan. I can't yeah. believe it. Yeah. 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 Mm-hmm. And uh, I'm really glad that I had Adam here because he told, like, after you leave Terrace, which is like the first planet, like the big kind of tutorial yeah. area, mm-hmm. you can explore the other four planets. And I did the Sith planet Korriban last. And the the last planet you're on is always uh, after the reveal. So you do three planets, yep. then the reveal, then you do the fourth one. So I was on the planet with the Sith Academy, and I was trying desperately to convince people, I'm Darth Revan! And nobody believed you. Yeah, they're like, they're like, sure, sure, and I'm yeah, Bugs whatever, Bunny. buddy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> What's a funny story? Yeah, yeah. So it was definitely fun reading that part in your notes because as you were playing the game, you had all these notes with you of just funny, random observations. That as someone who's played the game as many times as they, as they have, reading your notes of some someone who's never seen this stuff before, it was hilarious. Talking about why would you overload the terminal that you're at? It's just <laughs> why would you just yeah. why would you do that? <laughs> yeah, because yeah, you can. Yeah, you can hack the computers and you can like you can overload terminals to kill enemies in other rooms, but you can also overload the terminal you're at and just fall to the ground dead. Yeah. <laughs> or you can like kill people who like you have no reason to kill whatsoever. Like maybe they're imprisoned. Sometimes they're aliens. They're imprisoned, and you can just kill them to earn dark side points, just to be like absolutely evil, you know. <laughs> um, and like doing that same kind of thing. Like there's a, oh, the name of the species is uh, it starts with a D. Is a Duros. 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 Oh wow. See, yeah, that's Duros. why I'm here. <laughs> the Duros guy. The Duros guy. You know, he's like trapped in the energy field, and he's like, you know, please rescue me. And if you fail at the puzzle, he dies. Or I think if you sort of deliberately turn them all to the green or whatever, then he dies, and you. I think you get dark side points. But I mean, there's opportunities in the game where there's sort of the neutral neutral action you can take. Sometimes there's a good action. And then there's all kinds of opportunities to just be pure evil. And uh, it's very easy to be evil and oh yeah, get gold or get Republic credits. You know, it's kind of hard to be good, but it's like more satisfying for me to play as good. And so that's yeah. how I always do it. But there's actually like fewer opportunities, it seems like, to, to do the right thing in the game because it's such like a... You know, it's like a dark time for the galaxy and there's, you know, <laughs> all this suffering or whatever. Yeah, no, I definitely try to play good. At least my first time through, I would always try and do the good route. You know, that's my serious route. You know, I want to see how this actually folds out the way it's quote unquote supposed to be played. But then mm-hmm. after that, I will go ahead and just be as much of a dick as possible just to see what I can get away with. And yeah. it's 
refreshing, <laughs> to say the least. There are so many NPCs in the game where your final option is, screw this, I'm killing you now. Yeah. <laughs> and with uh, When I went to uh, Tatooine, I went to Tatooine first, and I, I had heard that there was a droid, a Malvi droid in the droid shop, but I didn't actually go to check it out right away. Turns out it was HK-47, one of the best characters in the game. <laughs> so Any game. <laughs> so <laughs> I... So, like, the way Tatooine is set up, like, you go down there. You have to leave. How do you leave? You get a, a Hunter's Lodge thing. How do you get the star map? You talk to the Jawas, blah, 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 and so on. And then you get to, uh, you have to go through the Sand People. Well, great. Well, to find the Sand People, walk south until you're attacked. Great! All right. Perfect. So I head down there, and I don't have HK with me, so I don't have anyone who can understand the Sand People dialect. So I communicated with them in the uh, universal language of senseless violence. <laughs> and, and because I didn't have HK with me, I didn't understand what was going on. It was all self-defense, and I gained zero dark side points. <laughs> yep. That's, that's my story, and I'm sticking to it. It'll hold up in any court in the galaxy. <laughs> Especially Manon. Yeah, when, Manon. When you, go yeah. To, when you go to court for murder and terrorism in the same day and walk away scot-free. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, the Manon court's fun. The, like, you're just... It's a, it's like a jury of uh, Selkath, and, and you're like the human on trial, and they're just like... Uh, you have the arbiter that you can use or you can represent yourself. And if you represent yourself, like you pretty much are, are screwed, right? It's kind <laughs> of, uh, it's very weighted against you. I think in, in my experience, I've actually, you know, probably back in the day when I tried to do it on my own to try and figure out what to say to you not get executed. Uh, I think I found that there is a way you have to say very specific things, but if you represent yourself, you can get out no problem and not have, you know, because I feel like sometimes the ar arbiter is more is more trouble than he's worth. Because it'll say, "Oh, he didn't know what he was doing. Oh, it's not his fault. Oh, he's crazy. You know, stuff like that." Oh, see, I just I just obliterated everybody in the Sith Embassy and found a data pad that said they were evil. So <laughs> look at but, this. Yeah, I wasn't even doing the missing Selkath quest. It's just, oh, here's a data pad. Oh, you're on trial for murder. Okay, um, here's a data pad. It says the Sith are evil. It, can I go? Oh, you can go free. Thank you. <laughs> Wait a minute. This is an etch a sketch. <laughs> God. Yeah. I really like their their alien uh, language. is really cool to listen oh, to. Yeah. It's it's good stuff. Yeah. It, it it is. I would say you know. Speaking of alien languages, it's it is something that I notice a lot more in future uh, Bioware games after Knights of the Old Republic, where they'll kind of have a sort of blanket language that isn't English, and whether it's for world-building purposes or just so they can have characters speak without recording dialogue for them. You know, it's something that... Co a trend that KOTOR definitely started that ended up seeing a lot, especially in Jade Empire. A star Mickey grab a mogul. Yeah, that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there was some guy who wanted to, like, do another quest, and this was on, like, Tatooine or something, and I was already, like... I don't play a whole lot of Western RPGs, but what I've noticed is they always, like, they tell you what you're supposed to be doing, and then they throw something else in your way. So you're, mm -hmm. you're always saddled with other things that you could be doing. And there was a point in my notes where I was like, F this. Yeah. Yeah, grab a mogo to you too, buddy. Have a good yeah. one. <laughs> sure, Sunry. I'll take you back to Dantooine. <laughs> or, is it Sunry? Uh, Jolie? No, the, uh, the little girl. Oh, Sasha. Sasha, thank you. Oh, my Man. God. Yeah. Sasha, the little girl. <laughs> yes, I'll go back to the planet that I just left and finished all my business on. Sunry's like Jolie's old friend yeah, from the war that's days right. that's like he's in jail and on Manon, so. That is a very fun quest. Yeah. I always kind of leave him hanging. I'm like, eh, I don't know Sunry. He's not my problem. But, <laughs> but, then, but then the girl, yeah, Sasha, I'm like, oh, geez, like, she needs my help, so. Yeah. yeah, it's funny how you you kind of you choose what uh, if you want to mess with certain things. Like there, there's a lot of content there if you want to have like that big like 60 hour playthrough or something. But I usually tend to just like fly through the game so I can start it up again and fly oh, through yeah. it again. You know, That's, yeah. <laughs> I don't know. So one thing that you've mentioned recently on Twitter is that you're actually uh, you either just finished or you are in the middle of a Star Wars movie marathon. Watching... Oh, someone. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. I was just gonna say someone else was asking like what what order would you recommend? I'm not I'm not actually marathoning them myself, but I do like I have a two year old and he just watches movies all day long. So like yeah, I mean 
I'm essentially constantly marathoning those kinds of movies, um, <laughs> but I'm not doing like a proper Star Wars marathon myself. But yeah, but sorry, go ahead. Well, first I was going to say, which one of the Star Wars movies is your favorite and why is it fanboys? <laughs> <laughs> oh, uh, you know, fanboys is fun. I, I think that it, it hasn't aged super well for me personally um, in some respects. I, I really <laughs> like what's his name? Uh, Dan, Dan Fogel. Yeah, he's great. OK, he's awesome. I like what's his name? J J Ch- Chera- <laughs> J J. Uh, Oh, yeah, man. the guy that's Bar- in all the How to Train Your Dragon movies now. Yeah, yeah, like Barrichello, Jay Barrick. I don't know, but yeah, Jay something. He's great. I like. I like the cast. I like Kristen Bell. I don't know. It just sort of it feels like a prelude to some of the like fandom culture wars we're seeing a lot of now. Yeah. Uh, but it doesn't mean to be that. It just it sort of happens to kind of be like a you know, to foreshadow some of the darker sides of the way Phantom has gone now. Um, I think at the time, you know, it, it, it was, you know, I don't want to get into it too much, but, but in terms of like, you know, there's just stuff that hasn't aged well, like, uh, you know, Harry Knowles is a character in the movie and it's like, you know, that's um, right. Yeah. You know, just little things like that where, you know, the last year or two hasn't been kind to fanboys basically. Um, and it's not necessarily that the movie is bad. I, I think stuff like the the Star Trek jokes are great. If I'm talking about favorite sort of like fan culture things outside of Star Wars, hmm, like as an alternative to fanboys or whatever, because like that doesn't quite do it for me anymore. Um, like I think a lot of that stuff, you know, that I used to love and watch constantly. I used to watch like the People versus George Lucas, and I loved that documentary. And I think just in the last couple of years – the yeah. way that the way that things have kind of gone in the culture have kind of made me have soured those experiences for me. I can't really enjoy them now. Um, but <laughs> that's just me and my dumb baggage of being kind of immersed in this for the last few years. Um, uh, oh, dude, I have like two full shelves of anime, and I can tell you how many of them can be improved by taking out the panty shots. <laughs> right. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. It's just you know, there's. Certain things, they don't age as well, but you, you can appreciate them for, you know, in their time. Yeah, I mean, there's endless examples of that. But I think if I'm going to choose my favorite Star Wars movie, it's going gonna, it's gonna to change from month to month. But the <laughs> two, the, for the last, what, year and a half, the two that I would say is my favorite are um, Last Jedi and Revenge of the Sith. I think that okay. if you catch me on the right day, I'll say Empire or Return of the Jedi. But yeah, basically, I, I tend to say The Last Jedi followed very closely by Revenge of the Sith okay. um, in, in terms of favorites. <laughs> yeah, I know. I, I'm definitely sort of in that camp, too, where on Monday it, it could be Return of the Jedi and then literally the next day it could be Rogue One. You know, it's one of those pretty much going back and forth. Yeah. But uh, I don't know, Cody, what about your... What are some of your favorite Star Wars movies? Because I know you and I view Star Wars movies very, very differently. Very differently. Yes. Um, so, uh, I appreciate the fantastical elements of Star Wars, but, you know, we all grew up with the prequels, and the prequels didn't exactly capture it for me. I saw the original when I was very young. It was on cable or something, and I thought it was okay. And then, really, my my formal introduction was the movies, and that's not that's also not the video games, not Clone Wars, just the movies. So my favorite has been Empire Strikes Back because I got to rewatch the Star Wars movies like a year or two ago, I think it was. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I really liked how Empire did kind of what Back to the Future 2 did, where it took everything about the first movie and it twisted it a bit and it made you think and it did some some cute unexpected things with the material like it was it was a smart, functioning, well put together piece of machinery there. And I really like seeing those kinds of things and how they evolve and, you know, the, the improvements <laughs> that get made. I'm a huge fan of Empire simply because it, it understands what the original Star Wars is and it plays with its concepts in an interesting way. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Speaking of playing with concepts of the original in an interesting way, you touched a little bit about Knights of the Old Republic 2 in your book. I want to know if you had anything further to say on Knights of the Old Republic 2, because I personally prefer Knights of the Old Republic 2 to the first one, as much as I love the first one, but playing Knights of the Old Republic 2 with the uh, expanded fan content activated. Sure. So a lot of people prefer KOTOR 2, and the fact of the matter is, 
when that game came out, I was playing a lot of Halo. I was playing a lot of other things. I think that when KOTOR 1 hit, I was absolutely swept away by it. It was the perfect game at the perfect time. And when KOTOR 2 came out, I sort of devoured it really eagerly. I was very excited that there was a sequel. I mean, back in the day, it wasn't always a sure thing that there was ever going to be a sequel. Uh, We got one basically immediately, like a year and four months later or something. So yeah, that was nice. I don't think it's something that I really enjoy replaying all that much. It seems silly because if I if I discuss it sort of critically, I think that it has like a richer inventory system, it has a richer like dungeon crawling experience a lot of the time, like just more enemies in the in the environments and sort of more of the turn-based combat that is just so much fun and makes the first game so good. There's just there's like a lot of more of that which may be a practical consideration because it's like, well, we can't finish the act three of the game. Um, LucasArts says we have to get this out by Christmas 20, 2004. So we're just kind of screwed. We have to like lop off act three and just like, you know, it may not be quite that much of it, but they just, they had to cut a lot of stuff. It was just, they had to. And, and so, you know, you'll notice that the first act of the game is like very, very like, you know, novel paced. Like it's just, you yeah. spend so much time on Paragus station. You spend so much time on the, what do you call it? Like the Citadel or whatever. Um, Citadel station. That's yeah. right. Yeah. Yeah. An orbit above Telos, I guess. Telos isn't bad. Just like Mass Effect, you spend too much time on the Citadel. Yeah. <laughs> I don't think you spend quite as much time on the Citadel in KOTOR 2 as you do in the first Mass Effect. I would do greatly prefer the, the second game, and I do completely agree with all your points. In fact, going through the game recently, after replaying it for the first time in a very long time with, with all the expanded content mod in it, on my second playthrough, one of the first things I did is found a mod on the uh, on one of the mod workshops to just skip Paragus because <laughs> yeah. as it's so cool and interesting and very system shock in a way the first time around. But after the first time, it just takes forever. Okay, so I, I felt yeah. the same way about Manon in the first game because yeah. there is exactly like two whole combat sections and. One is the Sith Embassy, and then the other is like that underwater section with the crazy Selketh. So the way I described it in my notes was like when you want to fight things, but the DM spends four hours talking about his cool water world and fish people. (laughs) So, And the way Bioware framed that, too, I thought was really cool because Tatooine is from the films. Kashyyyk, I believe, is from the films. It wasn't in the films yet. It was shown a lot in the expanded universe novels and comics, but it wasn't going to show up in the film until uh, Revenge of the Sith, which came out in 2006. Okay, so going from from Bioware's perspective, you have Tatooine and Kashyyyk, which are canon planets. You have Korriban, which is the stronghold of the Sith. So all of those are super duper appealing targets, and then you have Manan. So yeah. I think it's cool that they put the talky world building stuff on a planet that they knew nobody would pick first. Like from a game design standpoint, they knew everyone would pick the homeworld of the Sith, or Luke's home planet, or the Wookiee one. But, yeah, yeah. I thought that was really cool. Yeah, I love Manon from a storytelling perspective, but also, like, you guys have brought up Mass Effect a lot. So, like, look at the design of Auto City and, like, just all of that. And then look at, like, the first Mass Effect and the fact that, like, Derek Watts was the art director on both of those. And you can, like, you can so see the Citadel on Manon, you know? Oh, yeah. That's sort of, like, very (laughs) un-Star Wars-like, sort of chrome, very, like, smooth uh, you know, architecture or arcology or whatever you want to call it. It's sort of very, <laughs> you know, it's very like, uh, you know, it, it's very science fictional. It's it's not really something you'd expect to see in Star Wars in some respects. You know, Camino in episode two was like kind of Manon like, but uh, it's the most Mass Effect setting. And uh, yeah, it's kind of where they, they put a lot of their like, okay, we're going to leave our mark on the Star Wars universe. So we're going to have this thing, this thing, and this thing. And, and a lot of that stuff is on Manon and the Selkath and the name Manon are, are now still in the canon lore. So it's kind of, it's cool. It's that, that's sort of like Bioware's one of their concrete contributions to, to Star Wars as it still exists today is the, uh, the Selkath. So pretty neat. Something we had just touched on about uh, Manon and how it's essentially the uh, the planet that your dungeon master really wants to show off. 
Uh, yeah. Do you have any uh, prior experience with the Star Wars tabletop RPGs that KOTOR is kind of based on? I've played Pathfinder with friends. Um, I've never, I've never played a Star Wars tabletop game. I'm ashamed to say, um, <laughs> just because I grew up in a town of like seven or eight thousand people, and so, you know, I didn't know anyone who played D and D, let alone the Star Wars version of D and D. You know, I, I recall being like eight or nine or whatever, and playing like Star Wars Monopoly at a friend's house. And, <laughs> you know what I mean? And that was sort of like. You know, and uh, things like that. What was Boardwalk and Park Place? I gotta know. Was one of them the Death Star? Uh, I'm sure that it was. It's so, <laughs> it's so hard to remember. It's It was sort of like when the special editions were coming out, and it was sort of we were ramping up to the prequels merch. So, so it was sort of original trilogy themed, this Star Wars Monopoly. It, it may have been the first Star Wars edition Monopoly they ever put out, and yeah, I don't know. I, I just remember the sort of little pewter figurines, and I think I was Chewbacca or something. You know, it's kind of fun. Kind of fun. Chewbacca's adventures in high finance. <laughs> yeah. I, I mortgaged my cantina for 150 credits. Yep. Yes. This is something we touched, touched on much earlier regarding KOTOR is... Uh, Something that Bioware has become known for since then is having these really interesting, fun characters mm -hmm. to talk to. What are some of the characters that stand out to you? So in KOTOR 1 specifically, I'm a huge Bastila fan. Uh, I think that she holds up pretty well. I mean, you've got, oh, yeah. um, you know, Jennifer Hale is like a phenomenal actress. Um, you know, she's in Overwatch. She's in Elder Scrolls Online. She's in all these big games today, constantly working, you know almost always in the video game realm because she's really good at what she does. You know, she's sort of probably most famous and always will be most famous as Femme Shep, you know, Shepard. Yep. Um, yep. I mean, that's, you know, that's just uh, a history making performance, but I mean, Bastila is really great too. I think that some of that, comes down to the concept art a little bit you know i mean obviously like most of the credit goes to like the writers you know and, and uh and jennifer but also i mean the concept art for bastila you know she's a great looking character she looks sort of like the female you know obi-wan kenobi sort of like the ultimate jedi hero you know things like that i i think the jolie bindo some of the things he says are sort of <laughs> abrasive and annoying but at the end of the day i mean he's very memorable Kevin Michael Richardson is another phenomenal actor who still is like constantly in a voiceover booth because he's just so good and so recognizable. Um, I really like his sort of little tangents that he goes on his little stories about <laughs> oh, yeah. back in my day, you know, I knew a guy named Andor Vex and you remind me of him and he was a jackass and so are you. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, you know, I mean, he's, he's great. He's phenomenal. We were talking about KOTOR 2. I will say that my favorite thing about KOTOR 2, hands down, no contest, is Kreia. Absolutely. Both her dialogue as it's written and as it's it's performed by a London Shakespearean actress. So, I mean, <laughs> Kreia is kind of one of the best characters in Star Wars period. But yeah, in KOTOR 1, a lot of it comes down to the character designs. Uh, HK-47, you know, I sort of talk in the book. Uh, I sort of get straight from the horse's mouth. The uh, concept art director who designed HK-47, sort of the the design, the process, the thinking, the you know, the went into that character. The book also touches on how his voice came to be. I think that that's sort of a, an exciting thing that hopefully people will enjoy hearing about. I, I did. I really did enjoy hearing about it. Because as someone who hasn't played the game, like, I, I read EGM back in the day. Yeah, same. I've, yeah. Seen, I've seen screenshots of KOTOR, like, from when it came out to yesterday. I've seen screenshots of KOTOR, and every time I see one of them is going to be a screenshot of HK-47 saying something very witty and dour. Mm -hmm. But but in, in all my years of seeing these screenshots, like, I had never heard his voice. And I'd always imagined it to be, you know, something kind of sinister sounding, like, shall I execute these meat bags for you, master? But, mm -hmm. in fact, he just kind of sounds like C-3PO. Yeah. And, like, I love that in the book you go over, like, the way he was intended to be played and the way he eventually was played was his comedy angle. 
And, like, reading the script, like, reading the lines he is given, it's clear what they were going for, but him acting like C-3PO worked out even better. Yeah, <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah it's sort of... It's sort of very cheeky, but it's it's just, it's like sort of right on the edge of where, oh, no, I'm not being cheeky, Master. I'm being, you know, very earnest and, and kind. <laughs> and yeah. shall we kill something to cheer ourselves up? Like, <laughs> you know, uh, you know, things like that. It, it's, yeah, I, I can't do his voice, but, but yeah, he is so good. And, and I just, I think most of the principal characters in KOTOR 1... Uh, I like most of them. I think Candorus is cool as sort of like a, a microcosm of like the Mandalorian culture uh, as it existed yeah. prior to like the Clone Wars and Rebels sort of um, complicated that a lot. They sort of, you know, George Lucas and Dave Filoni got to sort of put their spin on it. All that history still sort of matters and it is sort of like background lore and, and Candorus is a really good sort of capsule of that. I like Mission, even though I think some of her dialogue is sort of like fanboys, you know, it sort of uh, yeah. doesn't hold up that well. But I think the performance is great. I think that her friendship with Zalbar the Wookiee is great. I think Karth is the guy who, you know, when you're a kid, you think, oh, this guy is really an annoying asshole and I don't like him. But I think now that I'm whatever, 29 and I have a kid, I like I understand Karth a little bit more. You know, I've never like I've never been like a war hero. So I like I don't know what yeah. all that's about. But but his sort of, you know, his sort of imperfections and kind of just. Yeah, I think he's really complex and, and, and not not one dimensional in the slightest. Like, you know, you might expect from sort of a you know a secondary star wars character who's just kind of there to to look cool and have nice hair and stuff and have a blaster <laughs> and to like be your crutch to lean on in the early parts of the game when your character sucks <laughs> yeah. yeah yeah you go in and get him karth i'm gonna stay here and uh sip on this uh back to, to heal myself or whatever <laughs> or colto i guess in kotor yeah. they're like we'll do colto I liked Joe Lee, especially bringing him to Korriban. Because Joe Lee is, like, a gray Jedi, he sees that the Jedi are idiots, but the Sith are also equally idiots. Mm -hmm. So there's so many lines of dialogue on Korriban where he's just flipping these guys shit. <laughs> like, like, one guy mm -hmm. will ask you, how should I punish these students? And Joe Lee, before you can answer, goes, what, you're too stupid to think of something yourself? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yeah, he's good. Yeah, and then uh, Candorus, I loved having him on Dantooine because there's this part where um, there's these farmers that are getting harassed by Mandalorians, and they're like, can you please help us with the Mandalorians? Mm -hmm. And Candorus doesn't, because he already told you about the war and all this stuff, and like, damn, you ever miss your own energy? Like, damn, what happened to me? <laughs> um, and so he calls out the farmers, like, one... These Mandalorians here, they're a bunch of podunk backwater nobodies if they're raiding your farms out here in the middle of nowhere. And two, you guys are double wimps because you can't handle those wimps raiding your farms. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of little short stories that have nothing to do with the main quest that, that KOTOR really gives you. And, I, you know, you can see that stuff in a lot of RPGs, but seeing it in Star Wars is kind of unique and fun. There's, like, the Romeo and Juliet quest... There's like the Rose for Emily quest where the widow like bangs her droid, <laughs> uh, you know, but it's, yeah, it, it's funny. It's, there's a lot of like little goofy things like that, that the writers are just like, let's just sneak in all this stuff and, and kind of make our own uh, version of the Star Wars universe. And yeah. No, one of my favorite quests in all of the first KOTOR game is is the investigation on Dantooine where you have, like, a murder scene and oh, you have the two yeah. suspects. And I just, I don't know, like, piecing it together and made me feel so very, very good. smart. Yeah, I felt, I was really yeah. proud of myself after figuring it out. Yeah, they both intended to kill the victim, but only one of them, like, actually succeeded and the other one shot the other guy. So they're they're both guilty, I guess. Yeah, just of different things, yeah. <laughs> Oh man. Um so an another like quest thing that I that I really liked. Again, Korriban. Korriban's just awesome. I know, right? It is. It really is. 
there's this one section where, like, you go into one of the temples, and it's not just you, it's this uh, guy that's captured and tortured another Sith acolyte or trainee. And he's asking you questions about, like, you know, what would a Sith do? And if you answer correctly, I torture him until he dies. But if you answer incorrectly, I torture you until you die! Yep. <laughs> and, and this is one of the coolest things I've seen in a video game, because even if... Even if you answer with all light side answers, if you take all the torture just so the other guy lives, you don't die anyway. Like, the game sets it up as, if you tell the truth, you will die, but you don't. And I think that was really cool because if someone hasn't read a wiki or anything and they hold to their convictions and they continue to answer and get tortured, they're not punished for it. I thought that was bloody awesome. Yeah. Yeah. There's a lot of puzzle stuff on Corbin that is, yeah, it's where the game gets very sort of D&D, &D, very, you know, classic RPG. And um, because you're literally uh, delving into these tombs, these dungeons. So uh, it does. It, there's like gratuitous puzzles. There's um, big monsters like the Tarentatech monster, I think. Oh, yeah. You run into a few of those down there. And that was literally one of the little sort of pieces of trivia that I came across and researching the book is that those were they took a a D, D character that they you know took from D, D, put it into like neverwinter nights i believe at some point and they're like we'll just do like the star wars version of that and they called it the torrent tech and in the clone wars season six qui-gon talks about the torrent Techs. so because of kotor you know this the, there's these little bits of D, D and kotor things that are are permanently part of star wars so that's kind of fun but uh yeah, Corbin is really exciting, and, and I think it's something that will continue to kind of influence Star Wars in the future. Yeah, I think one of my favorite parts about Korriban is something that, uh, as you were playing it, you were talking about the two uh, Sith Masters that are kind of vying, you know, one's trying to top the other one. Mm -hmm. And I asked who, who you supported, and I and I kind of figured you would say you, you pick yourself, but uh, one of the things that... I don't think you told me that you uh, you did this while you were playing, but if you pretend to support both of the masters, you can actually cripple them both really, really badly. So the fight is a joke. Hmm. So, because I remember you told us like, yeah, I decided to pick myself, and they both ganged up on me and kicked the crap out of me. <laughs> so I feel like it's it is a very D and D thing to kind of sort of play both sides against each other, and also it it's really sort of a microcosm of how the Sith work, where they can work so hard and fight, you know, for so long to become, you know, the masters of the galaxy, but in the end, they'll always screw themselves over just mm -hmm. for more power. Anyway, how much time do we have? Running out, but... A little tiny bit. Okay, well, so, um, two questions then? Yeah. All sure. right, so, given your relationship to Star Wars and, and how passionate you've been in this community, like, what are your hopes and dreams for Episode Nine? Oh, man. Like, I mean, I think as long as it's a good film, I'll enjoy myself and I'll be able to live with it and just love it. But, uh, you know, there are definitely certain things that I would like to see. I would like to see Kylo Ren is the son of Han Solo and Princess Leia. He is sort of the what's left of the Skywalker legacy, you know. Carrie Fisher's still in the film as Princess Leia because of unused footage and things. Um, it'll be interesting to see how much of her made it in, you know, I like supposedly they have quite a bit of footage, um, and that, you know, that they got very lucky and, and were able to, to feature her more than people would expect. But, you know, I'd like to see Kylo sort of, uh, come back to the light. I'd like to see sort of the, the new cast. I would like to see them used well, you know, you've got Richard E. Grant, um, you know, I used to joke on Twitter, like, oh, he's going to be Thrawn. I don't think he's going to be Thrawn. <laughs> I, I hope he's somebody very cool, you know, that is yeah. that, that kind of role where maybe, you know, Kylo doesn't need to be the main villain anymore because you've got Hux trying to be the villain and then maybe Richard E. Grant steps up and is the villain. I mean, who knows? Uh, you've yeah. got the the throwaway lines about, you know, Master of the Knights of Ren in The Force Awakens, and then we never really heard about the Knights of Ren again, so... There's an assumption that the Knights of Ren are going to be in the film. I would love to see Carrie Russell be like the main Knight of Ren, you know, the second in command after, you know, I'd love to see something like that. I I really, I have no idea what is going to happen in the movie. Um, and that's what's so exciting is like, you've got Lando in the film. 
so there's sort of the question of, well, what the hell has Lando been doing for the last 30 years? <laughs> um, yep. yeah. gonna be, gonna be fun to find that out. Um, I mean, we know some stuff from Battlefront two and, and books and comics, but yeah, there's like, there's a lot of room to play. You know, they, they haven't written themselves into any corners. They've kind of given the sequel trilogy a lot of breathing room, um, with the sort of comics and the, the books and things. So yeah, it's going to be exciting. I feel like I really don't know what to expect. You know, I'd like to see Kylo live. Um, I'd like to see Ray really shine the way that Luke Skywalker did in, in Return of the Jedi um, and just sort of be that hero. You know, I want I want everybody to, to sort of get their heroic moment and not die like Rose and <laughs> Rose and, and Finn and Poe. Like, I don't want to see any of them die on screen. Uh, yeah. You know, I don't know. I just love all those characters so much. You know, I sort of worry about Lando. I feel like, you know, Han Han did his heroic thing to help his son. And now I'm like, oh, Jesus, like Lando, be careful, buddy. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so anyway, you know, it's just funny. Um, It's fun to think about. The whole point of the the first film was kind of like that the First Order, you know, they're this new threat. The New Republic did not take them seriously. And then we saw the seat of power, like where the, the Senate was located, got annihilated by the Starkiller base. And it's like, oh, shit, you probably should have, like, uh, taken the First <laughs> Order seriously. Like, they're a threat. And so now, now it's like, okay, so we got to get rid of those guys. Uh, I just hope that that doesn't mean Kylo also. I'd like to see him kind of... Uh, you know, be redeemed. We'll we'll see. Yeah, I would like to see that too. Because for me, one of the uh, one of the reasons why Return of the Jedi is making a commitment here. It is my favorite Star Wars film. Is Return of the Jedi. But it's good. One of the reasons why I feel so strongly about it is that to me, one of the key points of Star Wars, just of a narrative focus, has always been the concept of redemption. Even mm-hmm. in even in Kotor, you know, near the end, after you defeat Malak, if you're if you do the light side ending, you know, Malak will realize that hey. Revan set me up on this dark path, but I could have gotten off this ride whenever I wanted, and I have nobody but myself to be blamed. I would like to see Kylo Ren live in the upcoming Star Wars movie, because I feel like that would just sort of, you know... It would make sense for Star Wars, because it's about redemption. From an ADD kid slashing computers with his lightsaber to actually being, like, a leader of something. Yes. All right. Uh, Anyway, one final question. Uh, What are your thoughts and opinions on Star Trek? I don't have a a bunch of opinions on Star Trek. I'm a <laughs> I'm a fan. I'm a fan of. I thought Star Trek Beyond was a great movie. Like any way you cut it, like it's just a good movie. Personally, you know, I, I like the original the original series quite a bit. I've seen a lot of the original series. I don't really have much experience at all with sort of the '90s stuff. You know, like Deep Space Nine. Next Generation. I don't really have an opinion on those. Uh, I tried to watch the, you know, the Next Generation Season 1. I found it sort of not my bag. Um, Yeah. Yeah, I mean, that's just me. You know, I grew up with Star Wars. Um, It's a very different kind of thing. I like a lot of space opera. Yeah, I don't know. It's just, you know, all the different Star Treks kind of have their own feel. I think that I'm going to watch Discovery, and I think I'm going to really like it. I haven't haven't gotten around to it yet. I think Into Darkness, you know, tried to do some cool things narratively, and it just didn't quite pull it off, really, for me. It felt like the same story as, like, you know, The Dark Knight and Skyfall and The Avengers. They all have the, the same plot where the bad guy's like oh i'm super smart so therefore i will let you catch me and then (laughs) and then i will tell you my plan while i'm in this cage and the plan is yeah i don't know i mean this big fishbowl because it's always a big glass you know cage of some kind that you can see out of but uh yeah my wife has been watching the new uh star trek show because she's more of a trekkie than than me i'm definitely into star wars that's that's why our wedding was a star wars star trek wedding but uh, she's told me nothing but good things about the new Star Trek show, and I know eventually I'll, I'll get to it, but I'm really bad at watching TV. Uh, is there anything else? Cody? So, Alex, did you have any questions for us? Oh, shoot. Um, I don't know. I guess in terms of the book, right, like how did you feel about the – did you feel like you got enough out of the book that uh, that you were satisfied with the amount of um, – because, you know, it's very short, right? But I did yeah. – because Boss Fight, you know, they, they contracted for 30,000 words, and I think I gave them, like, what, 28,000 words or something like that. So, <laughs> so it was like, you know, if there's going to be a complaint, it's that, like, oh, you know, more, 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 right? Like um, – 
Did you feel that way, I guess, would be my question. Uh, I would say so. Uh, one of the <laughs> things that I wanted to do about, you know, after I finished reading the book the first time, I thought, I want to read it again. <laughs> so yeah, I definitely felt like I got my my uh, zero dollars and zero cents out of the book <laughs> that I got for it. <laughs> um, but uh, no, I'd, I'd definitely like to buy a paperback copy of that. Cool. Yeah. Yeah, I, I liked the, the book and how it was structured. It was it was all killer, no filler, which is really, like, the best way to do it. Like, you know Pink Floyd's Dark Side of the Moon? Everyone remembers mm-hmm. Dark Side of the Moon and not The Wall so much because Dark Side of the Moon is 38 minutes of just tight, clean, awesome music. And The Wall meanders a bit, and it, it hurts it a little bit. So I would yeah. pick something that's short and concise over something that's, that's long and a little directionless. Um, I liked a lot of the anecdotes. I liked... Um, especially like the voiceover part where you talk to, to Darren O'Farrell, I believe. Yeah. And he talks about like Ed Asner got called in last minute, signed a bunch of forms, take the gum out of your mouth, Ed! And then, you know, just starts <laughs> yeah. doing the lines for Master Vrook. I, I would say, you know, and that's largely, that largely depends on the, the type of people you can talk to. Because if you can find those people that have those stories bottled up like that, those are awesome because they're, they're educational as well as entertaining. And I think like... That's the best way to write some of those books. You covered the aspects of game design pretty well. Because, I mean, you know, there's dozens of people who worked on it. There's only so many people you can talk to. Mm-hmm. I don't remember there being anything about the soundtrack. And I know it's hard to write words about music. <laughs> yeah. Well, I did try to get Jeremy Soul because I have interviewed him once before. And I contacted him. I just wrote an oral history of Morrowind also mm-hmm. over the last year. And I tried to contact him for the Morrowind piece. And I tried to contact him for the Star Wars book. And both times he's just he's afraid to talk about it for fear that uh, he'll violate an NDA and get himself in trouble. Oh, shit. You know what I mean? You know what I mean? They just released like a small update today on the Old Republic, the MMO, where they added Dantooine to the game. Oh, nice. And I, I haven't like seen anything from it yet, but, you know, he sort of famously, you know, did the soundtrack for KOTOR and there's sort of recognizable melodies. You know, maybe he did something for that. I I don't know. But yeah, he uh, he was afraid to talk to me about either ZeniMax games or Star Wars games. So... Which is funny because he did he did do one e- uh, email interview with me like two years ago for Morrowind when I just did a, a small little feature for Glixel about it. So yeah, I don't know. That was that was a big bummer for me to not talk about the music uh, because I in my outline I had a whole chapter called Sunset Over Manon and I was gonna write oh, a whole wow. chapter about the music and interview him and yeah he just wouldn't he wouldn't do an interview so. Oh, yeah. No. So that that one hurts to hear a little bit, but I agree with you 100% because the music is so so good. Oh yeah. I didn't even know it was mostly original compositions too because it all sounds so Star Warsy. Yeah. Right. He he'll use like little like what do you call them like let motifs or leap motifs where he uh the the force theme is sort of lightly embedded in the Bastila theme. Um Bastila has her melody and it's very like somber and sad and kind of really beautiful but original and then it sort of builds to a crescendo and then it'll do dun 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 you know so yeah. i mean yeah damn the kotor music is great um but yeah that's a big regret of mine is is not like just sort of uh you know forcing him to talk to me no jeremy you will interview me <laughs> <laughs> just just wave your hand these are the droids you're looking for yeah <laughs> but yeah he didn't uh, but yeah, you mentioned Dark Side of the Moon and the Wall, so I'll have to come back for another episode and we'll just talk about Pink Floyd for an hour. I'll just throw that <laughs> out there. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but that was a great metaphor. Uh, I agree with that. So yeah, I, I hope people enjoy it. It comes out April 9th. And um, yeah, I really poured my heart and soul into that book for about a about a year and a half or two years, sort of off and on kind of uh, while I was doing other things as well. But uh Yeah, I mean, you know, it's a game that if I have to pick one game to be stranded on a desert island for the rest of my existence with one game, you know, KOTOR is probably going to be the one, you know, and uh, it just, you know, it's one of the best pieces of Star Wars. It's one of the best pieces of RPG history. Um, And yeah, like getting to, to tell that story for the first time was like truly a dream come true. And so hopefully that comes across when people read the book and... The fact that you said you wanted to read it again is a really nice compliment. So I'll take it. I'll take it. <laughs> well, there's a recently we just had Emerald City Comic Con here in Seattle, and I was walking around downtown Seattle 
while there was convention stuff going on. And there's a place in international district called the Pink Gorilla, and they actually had uh, boss fight games in print to sell at yeah. at this place in Seattle. I'm like, oh man, I should come back here after the uh, you know after Alex's book comes out, and I can buy a physical copy. <laughs> I actually, actually have it in my library with all my other Star Wars books. So awesome. yeah, no, I I'd be okay with that. Yeah. So Alex, where can people reach you? I tend to show up at starwars.com and Polygon lately. Um, I write for whoever will pay me to write about video games and, <laughs> and space wizards uh, in any combination. But, but yeah, I, I mostly live on Twitter, like retweeting dumb stuff and, and also writing, tweeting dumb stuff as well. So uh, I'm at Alex J. Kane, K-A-N-E. And yeah. Alex Kane is a freelance writer and the author of Star Wars Knights of the Old Republic for Boss Fight Books. Alex, thank you so much for coming on the program. Thank you guys so much. Oh, you are very welcome. Thank you for talking to us about your book and <laughs> giving me an excuse to talk about Star Wars for an hour. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was a lot of fun. 